everybody, it's Dan from No Cones Garage, and welcome to Tech Talks. This video series is going to provide additional information that may help you to understand what's going on with some of the build projects. In this particular video, we're going to provide some definitions of various suspension terms. I want to talk about the many terms that define the geometry the suspension has. For this car, the type of suspension I'm using is a dual A-arm type suspension. The terms discussed apply to all different suspension types, multi-link, strut, solid axle. However, the specific way they're defined does differ from type to type. In order to more clearly communicate the effect some of the suspension geometry changes have on a dual A-arm type suspension, I've created the No Cones Garage Tiny Suspension Understanding Enhancer. Let's pretend together that the wheel is not made out of a cottage cheese container on it. All right, what I've built is a very simple A-arm suspension that enables me to show various geometric features and adjust them in a very small scale. And it functions like a real A-arm suspension. So the first term I want to define is the steering axis. The steering axis is simply the line that goes through the center of the upper ball joint and the lower ball joint about which the wheel rotates. Now that we understand how the steering axis is defined, we're going to talk about the effects it has on wheel motion. We're going to evaluate the steering axis from two different views. We're going to view it from the front and from the side. We'll start from the front. The angle the steering axis makes relative to a vertical line through the contact patch, the center of the contact patch of the tire, is called the kingpin inclination. When designing suspension, we want to try to keep kingpin inclination to the smallest value possible. That's because kingpin inclination results in positive camber when the wheel is turned to both left and right, meaning both the inside and outside wheel will experience positive camber rather than the desired negative camber. As you can see here, the wheel is pretty much vertical. But as we turn it, you can see a gap generate at the bottom in both directions. So positive camber is introduced. Another dimension that we care about that's related to kingpin inclination is the scrub radius. Scrub radius is the distance between the intersection of the steering axis and the ground and the line that represents the center of the tread of the tire. So as you can see here, we have a very small scrub radius. So I've adjusted the mock-up to introduce a fairly large amount of scrub radius. As you can see, as the steering is turned, the upper ball joint can be seen to move up and down. at both extremes. The effect of that is going to be that the entire front end of the vehicle will move up and down as you turn. That's not desirable because that weight has to be transferred through the steering system and ultimately to the driver's arms through increased steering force, but not the kind of steering force that provides good feedback. So when I design the front suspension, I like to minimize kingpin inclination and minimize scrub radius to the lowest value practical within the limits of my upright geometry. I've now adjusted the mock-up to demonstrate the other angle made by the steering axis. And that one's called caster. And that's simply the angle the steering axis makes when viewed from the side. As the angle increases, this would be the rear of the car. That's considered positive caster. Caster differs from kingpin inclination in that the effects are not the same when turning left and to the right. When turning the inside wheel, so in this example, saying that this side of the, the mock-up is the back of the car, as we turn the inside wheel, we'd introduce positive camber as we would with kingpin inclination. However, when we turn the other direction, we introduce negative camber. And again, that can be shown 
fairly substantial amount of camber can be introduced. So obviously the effects of caster angle and kinkpin inclination can cancel each other out. However, if you can minimize kinkpin inclination and have a relatively high value of caster angle, you can gain a lot of negative camber and control the camber of the tire through steering angle, which I find to be a desirable trait of a suspension. You do have to watch scrub radius because again, the distance the tire is does introduce weight jacking and just like camber angle, the weight jacking effect is not the same in both directions. And so the inside tire will be forced down and the outside tire will lift up. That will result in a cross car, cross vehicle weight transfer. And again, that weight transfer has to be achieved by the driver. All right, so in addition to the dimensions we've discussed for the steering axis, we now need to talk about the actual arm geometry itself. Arm geometry being the upper and lower ball joints on the uprights and then the inner locations making the A-arms top and bottom. The first thing I want to point out is that vehicle track width is defined from the center of each tire. That's just because when the contact patch, you know, the tires act on the road surface through the contact patch, which runs from side to side, and so it's best to approximate the forces as coming in through the center of the tire. So the first dimension I want to discuss is the virtual swing arm length. And that's defined as the length from the center of one contact patch to the instant center, which is the intersection of the upper and lower A-arms. So you just extend that dimension out until they intersect. This is an important dimension because these pair of A-arms, as they move through their travel up and down, behave in the same way as a swing arm suspension of that length, meaning that the curve that this tire is going to go on is simply a solid line of that length. Um, there will be some changes because the ratio of these lengths, the instant center will move in or out very slightly. However, the camber curve of the tire is pretty much defined by the VSAL of the static right height. The instant center is also where the actual force from the contact patch will act through. And so the roll center is defined as the intersection of the right and left lines through the instant centers and the contact patches. So obviously this is shown with the chassis not in a corner. If the chassis were in a corner, your instant centers will move around. This red line for each tire will move around and the roll center could therefore move in or out, but it will always behave or it will always lie at the intersection of those two lines. What the roll center is, is that is the point about which the actual chassis will physically rotate. The last thing I want to talk about is the effect different virtual swing arm links have on the vehicle. As you can see on this chart, that as the ratio of the virtual swing arm length to track width gets larger, the amount of camber we will gain during bump and roll get less. When we roll the chassis, we actually start to get positive camber because the chassis leans and the tire leans with it. And so the best we can do in roll is have our camber curve reduce the amount. So here you can see, for example, we have our two degree of camber line. And as the track width gets, the, the VSAL gets really long, we start to approach two degrees, which means our camber curve is not reducing the amount of positive camber gained in roll. And you can see that the amount of negative camber we're gaining in bump reduces as well. So what does that mean? So that means in the front, I like to run longer VSALs because I have caster that I can use to introduce camber. In the rear, I don't have caster. So I'll run shorter VSALs, usually from 0.75 to 1.25, so far, we've only discussed the considerations of lateral forces coming through the A-arms and acting on the chassis. A similar geometric effect occurs during longitudinal acceleration. We can develop force vectors for the upper and lower A-arms by drawing lines through the forward and rear 
inboard pivots of those arms. If the A arms are parallel to the ground, those two lines will never intersect. In that situation, your instant center is at an infinite length. The force from the tire will be reacted at the ground surface. That will act on the center of gravity of the car. Depending on that height, a relatively large moment can be developed which will result in suspension squat. By manipulating the height of the inboard pivots of the upper and lower A-arms, geometry can be developed that results in an intersection of these two force vectors. The moment acting on the suspension during acceleration then becomes the difference in height between the center of gravity and the intersection of the two A-arms. If the height of the intersection and the center of gravity are equal, no downward force will be generated through weight transfer during acceleration. This is referred to as 100% anti-squat geometry. Similarly, the reverse can be done on the front suspension to result in resistance to diving under braking. This is referred to as anti-dive geometry. That's going to do it for this tech talk. I hope you learned something new about suspension. Head on over to the LMP360 build, episode 3, to see what we do now that we have all this new understanding of suspension. Thanks again for watching, and see you next time. Intersect. Stupid magnet.